All right, YouTube, today we're looking at a problem where we've been given the stopping distance of a car on level ground. And we're gonna solve for the stopping distance of that car when it's on a hill. Now, the first thing we're gonna do in this problem is take a look at the car on the level ground. And we're gonna solve for the coefficient of friction, or mu, between the tires and the road. Now, to do that, the first thing we're gonna do is take a look at the kinematic equations. So using the kinematic equation VF squared equals VI squared plus 2AD, and substituting in the initial speed of the car as well as the stopping distance, we can solve for the acceleration of the car. And knowing the acceleration of the car, we can turn to force in order to solve for the coefficient of friction between the tires and the road. Now to do that, we're going to first draw a free body diagram of the forces acting on the car. Now the first force is the force downward by gravity. Then there's the normal force holding the car up. And when the car is on level ground, the normal force is equal to the weight of the car, mg. Then, of course, there's going to be the friction force backwards, causing the car to slow down or accelerate. Realize we already solved for that rate of acceleration. So we're going to apply Newton's second law, or F equals ma, to the horizontal axis. So we know the mass of the car is some value m, and we're going to use the horizontal acceleration, which we already solved for. Now realize, it's that friction force which is acting as the net force on the car, causing it to slow down. Now because we have objects moving in one direction, yet accelerating in another direction, it's really important we establish a positive direction here. So we're going to say forward is the positive direction, which means our friction force is in the negative direction. Now we define friction as being mu times fn, where fn in this case is mg. So substituting that term into Newton's second law, you'll see the mass of the car cancels out. And substituting our term for acceleration, which we found from the kinematics, we get an expression for the coefficient of friction between the tires of the car and the road. You realize this isn't the answer to the question, and there's no real gems or nuggets of knowledge hiding out in this function. It's just that, a function, which we're going to use later on. Now realize, when we look at the car on the hill, there's still going to be that same coefficient of friction between the tires and the road. So using that coefficient of friction, we can now solve for the displacement of the car as it slows to a stop on the hill. And in solving for the stopping distance of this car on the hill, we're really just working the previous part of the problem, when the car was on flat ground, in reverse. So we're going to start at Newton's second law. But rather than looking at the motion of the car horizontally or vertically, we're going to look at the motion of the car in the plane of the hill. So again, let's draw a free body diagram, starting with weight or force by gravity. That's still going to be mg. And next there's the normal force. Now because the car is on a hill, the normal force is not going to be equal to the weight of the car. And we'll get to that in a little bit. And last, of course, there's friction. Now anytime an object's on a hill, the force by gravity can be broken up into components. The first component being perpendicular to the hill, and the second component being parallel to the hill. Now realize, that component of gravity perpendicular to the hill is the normal force. Now we're applying Newton's second law within the plane of the hill. So looking at Newton's second law within the plane of the hill, we have the force down the hill, that's the positive direction, minus the friction force which is acting up the hill. We say it's minus because it's in the negative direction. Now for a block on a hill, a normal force is given by mg cosine theta, and the force down the hill is given by mg sine theta. So substituting our term for the force down the hill into Newton's second law, and then substituting our term for normal force into the friction force, we wind up with this function. And you'll see the mass of the car rather conveniently cancels out. Next, subbing in our coefficient of friction, which we found when the car was on a level surface, we get this expression for the acceleration of the car on the hill. So now going back right to where we started, the kinematic equations, we can solve for the stopping distance of the car on the hill. Plugging in our term for acceleration and solving for dh. We get this expression for the displacement of the car down the hill. So to check this equation, let's take a look at some different values for theta. And starting with extremes, let's start with the hill being completely flat, not a hill at all, or where theta is zero degrees. So putting zero degrees into our equation for displacement, we find this whole thing just boils right back down to the stopping distance is in fact the original stopping distance of the car. Now going to the other ridiculous result, let's say the hill was in fact a wall, or tilted at 90 degrees. And YouTube, something really weird happens here. 
You see, there's limitations to this equation. And let me show you what's going on. See, if we tilt the hill up to just the right angle, the force down the hill is equal in magnitude to the friction force, meaning they're canceling each other out. And above that angle, the force down the hill is always going to exceed the friction force. The car will never be able to stop. So setting the force down the hill equal to friction, we can find the limit of angles, or really the steepest the hill could be, that will allow the car to stop. Oh, left out a G. So YouTube, this has been how to solve for the stopping distance of a car on a hill. I hope you found this useful. And on that note, that's all for now.